All right. So yeah, we finished Galatians chapter two last time, and that was where Paul he he presented he came to the the pillars, the so called pillars of the church, presented the gospel to them that, that he had been preaching. He just wanted to make sure they understood that he was preaching the same gospel and that he had their support. And they did. They gave him the right hand of fellowship. And uh he he was God had called Paul and I believe it was Paul and Barnabas to take the the gospel to the Gentiles and Peter and and James and the others were sending the gospel to the Jews. And so Paul he then talked about some false brethren that had that uh, had sneaked in to saw the liberty that they had in Christ. And here comes Cheryl. Let me let her in. Saw the liberty they had in Christ, and they were trying to put them put them back into bondage. And Paul had to. They said they we didn't submit to them, not even for a minute. And uh, Paul said he also had to confront Peter, which is kind of interesting because Peter had been acting hypocritical. He had he had been eating with the Gentiles, but then when his Jewish brothers came along, he would jump up from the table he'd stand stand back and be aloof from the gentiles because he was afraid of the the the, the jews the because they they didn't i uh, think it was proper to to eat with gentiles so paul had to confront him he says you know you're you're distorting the gospel you're compelling these gentiles to live like jews and he repeated it must have said it three three times in there that he said he said you know basically you know better than that you said you know that we're justified by faith and not by the works of the law and he said i i through the law he said i died to the law so that i might be justified by faith and and he finished off that that uh chapter with that verses 20 and 21 where he says i've he said, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. In the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said, if we could be justified through keeping the law, he said, Christ died for nothing. So that's, he said, if you know, we're not, we're not going to be declared righteous through the law. That would be an insult to, to God, insult to what Christ did for us. So that's basically what chapter two is about. So then he starts off chapter three, calling the Galatians foolish, which is, I don't know, a good way to, to uh, start off here. Are you foolish Galatians? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So yeah, he says, who's bewitched you or who has put a spell on you? And uh, so why was he calling them? Why was he coming, calling them foolish? Somebody want to read? Verse 1, Galatians 3, verse 1. Let's all read verse 1 and 2. I can do that. All right, thank you. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This I only want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing of faith. All right. So, yes. So now keep in mind that, you know, originally the chapters two and three ran together, you know, all, all of scripture, there's no chapter breaks origin in the original writing. So that this is coming right alongside what he just got done saying in, in chapter two. You know, we, we, it's Christ now lives in me. I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God. I don't nullify the grace of God because righteousness that came through the law then Christ died needlessly. So taking that along with those two verses that Carly read. So why is he calling the Galatians foolish? What were they, what were they doing? It sounds to me like they were reverting back to um, being um uh, sanctified i guess by by works rather than than through faith yeah that, that's pretty much it they yeah they're going they're basically going back to the law maybe they didn't even realize it and we i mean we can do something similar we can you know we can make a law out of uh you know our quiet time with god our prayer our bible reading um our time at, at church our time spending in bible study like this i mean they, those are all good things to do i'm sure what they were doing was they were good things, but but yeah, we have to 
remember that th those aren't the things that make us right in God's in God's sight. They don't they don't save us. They don't keep us saved. They don't keep us in uh, in a right standing with God. It's it's all by faith in what Christ did. So yeah, they were they were going they were basically going back to their their self works, their self effort, trying thinking that that's what was going to keep them in a good standing with God. And, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Lori. Like, how do you know if you're slipping back? Like, yeah. what indication would give you some type of idea that you might be reverting backwards instead of staying in the faith, but yeah. going back to the letter of the law? Yeah, great question, Lori. Yeah. Uh, before I answer, anybody have any thoughts on that? What What would What would you think would maybe give you a clue? would think like they their um their actions you know what are they doing um do they are they having like sins piling up in their life and um i always feel like a, my conscience is telling me like i'm off kilter it's something inside me just like uh something's just off but um okay yeah so it's subtle sometimes you don't know you're doing it, it yeah. it's subtle. Yeah. sometimes you don't notice it yeah. Okay. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Sometimes when um, you're doing, uh, well, when maybe I'm doing things that are truly, really out of out of habit because it's the the right thing to do, and I have to like check my check my heart yeah. and and check my my motivation. Like, am I just Am I reading my Bible to check the box because I know this is what a um, Christian woman should do, or is am I trying to develop relationship? Am I trying to learn? Like, is it you know that sort of thing? Even like with going to church or I'm listening to Christian music because I I should. You know, it to me it's it's heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that that's a good answers. You know, if, if I feel like I have to do something, if I I have to read my Bible, or else you know God's going to be upset with me, or you know I have to be listening to Christian music, or you know, if, or if we feel condemned, you know, oh, I you know I missed my quiet time with the Lord, I feel condemned. You know, I mean, it should it should. Uh, what do I want to say? I mean, if I miss my quiet time with the Lord, I, you know, it, it should bother my conscience, but I shouldn't feel condemned. Like, oh, now, you know, yeah. God's going to be mad at me. You know, he, he, he may be sad that, you know, we missed the time together, but, you know, he's not going to, God's not going to punish me because I, you know, I missed my quiet time or I, you know, I, you know, I listened to a secular radio station today instead of a Christian radio. So I think that, I think that's part of it, you know, and and that's what Satan wants to do, doesn't he? Satan wants to condemn us. If you're feeling condemned because you messed up, that's that's Satan. If you're feeling maybe like like you talked, Cheryl, maybe your conscience is bothering you, feeling you know like conviction by the Holy Spirit, you know, you know, well, that wasn't you know that wasn't a, a smart move. I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That. Yeah. That. I mean. That. that I think that's appropriate. We should feel some sense of i don't know remorse or repentance i don't know what the word is i want to use but but it shouldn't be guilt or condemnation if it's if you're feeling guilt or condemnation then you're maybe you are going back to legalism that you're thinking that you know all you know god's upset with me or he's going to punish me i don't know does that does that make sense that's, that, that's good i mean i wanted to know to try to find that balance because yeah. we are to have you know our worship time devotions and sure. you know, spiritual disciplines yeah. but i just needed to know for myself because like you said anybody could slip back yeah and if we're not paying attention yeah we'll be going right back to where we were before yeah before we really start walking in the faith and learning and understanding it yeah 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 good points mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's easy to fall into that trap yeah all right we had Amira. We lost her. Wonder what happened. Our <laughs> our new member. I think it's Amira. Is that her? Let me see how. I'm not sure how she pronounces it. I was hoping she would tell us. 
Oh, well, maybe she'll connect again. I'm going to text Connie. She She's planning on coming, and she says she has a tendency to forget. So let me text her to remind her. <laughs> Not that any of us have any trouble remembering things, right? <laughs> So, all right, so the next question, okay, um, what is verse two, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? Verse two? Uh, yeah, he, uh, let's see, well, how about, somebody want to read verse two and three? I think I had you stop at verse two, didn't I, Carly? Verse two and three, how did you... Receive the Holy Spirit. I can read that. Okay. Galatians 3, 2, and 3, right? Yep. Okay. Um, let me put this question to you. How did your new life begin? Was it by working your heads off to please God? Or was it by responding to God's message to you? Are you going to continue this craziness? For only crazy people would think they were complete by their own efforts, what was begun by God. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough to begin with, how do you suppose you could perfect it? Did you go through this whole painful learning process for nothing? It is not yet a total loss, but it certainly will be if you keep this up. This is a message version. Yeah, I was gonna <laughs> so, say, it must be the message. Yeah, it is. I just wanna, cause some people are like, what are you reading? Mm -hmm. No, I, I figured out right away. Yeah, that that, that yeah. would be that would be like you or I paraphrasing this, right? That'd be like Pastor Mike preaching. He, that's how he would say it, right? Yeah, so, and oh, it's yeah. like present yeah. day birthday, you know. Yeah. It's, right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the Pastor Mike version would be, Are you out of your mind? Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Uh huh. I do too. Yeah. So yeah. So he says, so how did how did you receive the spirit? It said, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? How, how did you and I receive the spirit? The Holy Spirit. He's, by faith. By faith, right? We, right? we we heard the gospel, we believed it, we were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Ephesians, let's see. I think I was quoting Ephesians 1.13. Let's see if that's what it was. Yeah, Ephesians 1.13. In Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Christ, in him, with the Holy Spirit of promise. So we heard the gospel message. We heard the truth of what Christ did for us on the cross, rose from the dead. We believed it, and we were received the Holy Spirit. Right. And let's see, without the spirit, those who do not have the spirit do not belong to him. So everybody who belongs to Christ, everyone who believes has the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. All right. So then he talks about in verse three. He says, Are you so foolish? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? What what does he mean by that? Okay, we began by the spirit. What does that mean? We pretty much just talked about that in verse two. We began by the spirit, by faith, right? We were, we believed, we received the spirit. So now he's talking about, are you now being perfected by the flesh? What does he mean by that? What, what does he mean by being perfect, perfected by the flesh? Maybe one of the other translations makes it a little clear. My, mine says, um, like, they try to do it on their own. They're mm -hmm. not, I'm not listening to the spirit. Yeah. Losing in touch with him and stuff and, and just thinking they can do it themselves. Okay. It's, it's going back yeah. to human effort, isn't it? 
What's that? It's it's going back to human effort instead of yeah. instead yeah. of trusting yeah. in what Christ did. We're going back to relying on on my own good works, my own uh, whatever it is, my own prayers, my own Bible reading, my own keeping the commandments. It's yeah. it's going back to self effort instead of trusting in what Christ did. Yeah. And, and now that you know. Again, it doesn't mean that we don't do those things. It doesn't mean that we, you know, deliberately go out and break the commandments. It doesn't mean that we neglect prayer. It doesn't mean we neglect Bible study. It's it's just that we don't rely on those things to to keep ourselves in a right standing with God. Right. We'll, we'll probably do those things even more if we're trusting in Christ, won't we? I mean, I I, I want right. to read the Bible. It it won't be a chore. It's it's reading God's love letter to me. I I want to read. I want to read God's love letter to me. I want to pray. I want to study his word. I want to fellowship with the saints. It's, mm -hmm. So. All right. Um, verse four, I'm not sure. I don't know enough about the history of the Galatians, what he's talking about. They're suffering so many things. Um, I don't know if they were suffering persecution or what. I don't know if anybody knows any history of the Galatians, what you might have been referring to there. Anybody hmm. have thoughts? One translation said that rather than being suffering many things, it could mean experience so many things, like experiencing the the working of God, the, the miracles, the new birth. It's possible that's what he's referring to. I don't does anybody have a translation that, that says it that way? Bible says that in the notes. Uh, Does it say that in the notes? That it's uh says the Greek word has the basic meaning of experience. Okay. It does not necessarily imply pain or hardship. Okay. So so yeah, it could be either one. He, he, I mean, he's yeah. just just got done talking about receiving the Spirit, and so that, that could be what he's talking about. You know, have you received the Spirit? Have you been born again? You've become a new creation in Christ. Have you experienced all that? If indeed it was in vain. You know, he says, has it all been for nothing that you've been born again, that you've received the spirit of God, that Christ has made you a new creation? Has it been for nothing? If now you're going back to self-effort, that might be what he's referring to there. That that would make sense. Yeah. <clears throat> and then verse five, again, somebody want to read that? That's pretty much saying... Same thing again, which I mean, that's just like us. We need to, if you're like me, I need to have things repeated to me two or three times before it finally sinks in. So Paul's repeating it again. Somebody want to read verse five? I can. All right. Does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing the faith? All right. So that, that would support what Dan shared on verse four doesn't it that sounds more like you know the experience the things that god has, has done so he provides god provides the spirit and he works miracles among you so does he do that does did god give you this this holy spirit and did you perform miracles because of what because of our works of the law or is it because of hearing with faith faith it's by faith right yeah faith. It's kind of a rhetorical question but yeah, he's just reminding him, you know, God didn't give you his spirit because of your works of the law. He didn't do any kind of miracles because of your works of the law, because of your self-effort. It was all because you heard the gospel and you believed it. Yeah. All right. So question four, I kind of skipped over that. What What's wrong with trying to be perfected by the, by the flesh? That's, that's question four. It's, it goes back to verse three. What, what would be wrong with that? I mean, it sounds noble, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds like a good thing. I'm I'm trying hard to 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 be a good person, trying hard to keep the commandments, trying hard to do everything right. Sounds good. I think it's the I in there. I'm trying to do everything this. I'm trying to do it. It's it's you're trying to do it. It's that pride inside you. Like I used to pride myself on being, being pretty independent, and then I heard one time that that that's a prideful thing, and mm -hmm. I was like. Oh, and I just found like, oh, okay, I, I, I'm now, you know, so yeah, <laughs> it's I like, it. yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah. It puts all the focus on me, right? Instead of putting my focus on Christ, I'm I'm putting it all on me. And it, it can have a couple of effects there. One, if I think I'm doing it right, it's going to get me puffed up. I'm going to be proud and, think, and, and I'm, I'm going to look down on everybody else that I think isn't, isn't doing what I'm doing. Right. Or it could be, have the other effect effect if i'm trying hard and i'm not successful then i'm going to be self-condemning like oh man i you know i messed up again so it, it's it's uh bad on a couple levels there and and the biggest thing is it takes the focus off of christ doesn't it it puts the focus on me instead of on christ and on others and it's a and it's a huge insult to god because it's it's denying what christ has done what christ has done for us he's he's di died for nothing if if it's all up to me also um the flesh profits us nothing amen i mean if we could do it ourselves then we wouldn't need god we wouldn't need christ he amen. would everything he'd done would have been in vain if we could do it ourselves yeah and well and as you're saying that another thought came to mind and it, when we get to chapter five it'll be pretty obvious that the works of the flesh it's actually going to be counterproductive because it's going to make it's going to stir up our sinful desires. We we think we think it's a good thing trying to keep the commandments, trying to do all the right things, but it actually stirs up. You know, the law actually stirs up our sinful desires, and the works you you, you come. The result is the works of the flesh in chapter five, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but you know, you, you know the the works of the flesh that he listed there. Um, sorcery enmity strife jealousy uh, outbursts of anger that that you're not going to be and that those i mean those things are definitely going to happen aren't they? because we're going to well we're going to be jealous of others that we think are, are blessed more than we are because here i am i'm working my tail off trying to do all the right things and you know god you're not blessing me with everything that i think i deserve right so it's yeah it's just Lots of bad things happen when we try to be perfected by the flesh. All right. Um, we seek glory for ourselves rather than for Christ. Yeah. Makes us a slave to sin. Mm -hmm. All right. And kind of kind of already answered question five. That was the so many things that the Galatians experienced. And I think what Dan said. You know, they they experienced the the new birth they experienced the miracles i mean that that in itself is a miracle isn't it being born again becoming a new creation in christ that's one of the greatest miracles Receive the spirit a, a new nature yes. new desires all right and we answered question six already to what means does god provide his spirit and work miracles somebody want to answer that one again how does god provide his holy spirit and work miracles that was that was with verse five confused pardon oh i said i was confused oh <laughs> uh, yeah i i um, i got everybody out of whack yes yeah, question five um, yeah, I me <laughs> but yeah because the holy spirit that's what we talked about before yeah like, we, really gives us the holy spirit but we just gotta have to have faith to accept yeah, it. right it's by faith yep that's hearing true. hearing the word and believing it yep. yeah all right question seven how was abraham credited credited with righteousness you remember abraham he was way back what 400 and some years before the law was given he's like two thousand years before jesus so he he didn't even Jesus wasn't even born yet. So how how was Abraham how did how was he credited with with righteousness? Okay. Right standing with God. So he, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. Amen. I, I know God had told him something before that. I don't remember what it was, but yeah, yeah, he we'll believed get, him. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we're gonna get to that something here okay. in a minute. But yeah, he he believed God and it was credited as righteousness. And that's basically how when well, I'm probably jumping ahead again um yeah but anyway that's the same way that oh here comes connie all right that's the same way that you and i were credited with righteousness wasn't it we believe god and he credited yeah. his righteousness 
we we believe what God said to us about about Jesus, what Jesus did for us. But uh, yeah, we're gonna see that God actually said pretty much the same thing to Abraham about Jesus, but it was in a little bit different form. It was actually a a, a lie. How do how do I want to put it? Um, a living demonstration, maybe. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, yeah, he believed God, he believed the promise, and it was credited as righteousness. So next, that's the next question. Question eight, what was God's promise that Abraham believed? We're, uh, Connie, we're, da- we're on Galatians chapter three. We're down to verse, well, we're, we just read verse six. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness or credited to his account or imputed, depending on your translation. That, that's imputed, it's probably a word you don't use in everyday language, do you? Does anybody use the word imputed today? No. Oh, <laughs> no. yeah. what are you talking about? Maybe if you're an accountant, accountants might be imputed. Um, but it basically just means credited to your account. It, it means you didn't really earn it and credited to your account anyway. It would be kind of like, um, like let's say... Um, Let's say in, in high school, your final exams, the teacher's going to give you a give you an option. You, you have there's going to be a thousand questions. I'm going to mute you, Connie. You're getting a little feedback. Um, let's say your final exam there's a thousand questions. The teacher says you have to get all one thousand correct, and you and you'll pass the test. If you miss one, you're going to fail. It says, but I'm going to give you a choice. You can take the test yourself, or you can get your uh, your big brother, who's a genius who's already taken the test. He's already passed it. He already, he has a photographic memory. I, I give you the option. You can have your big brother take the test. And uh, if it was me, I'd, I'd probably, if I didn't think I was going to get a thousand points, I might go ahead and say, okay, I, you know, my big brother can take the test for me. And he gets, he scores a thousand and you get credit for the for passing the class it's kind of the same way with us and jesus you know, we can we can try to keep all the commandments there's how many are there 600 and some we can't even keep two <laughs> we, we, you know, we can try our hardest all you know, our entire lifetime if we can keep every if we can keep every commandment for our entire life without breaking one we pass we'll get to go to heaven if we break one commandment we fail we and we go to hell or we have the other option. We can trust in Jesus, our big brother. Let him take the test for us. And he did it. He lived a, his entire life, 33 years, without ever breaking one commandment. So when we trust him, it, it his perfect righteousness is credited to our account or it's imputed to us. So uh, I don't know. Does that, does that make sense? It does. The, yeah. other, the other thing you made me think of, Jim, was um whoever is trying to keep the law is under a curse amen amen yep uh, is that jeremiah 17 5 i believe wow. so see that well that was, yeah, jeremiah 17 5 that might be whoever trusts in flesh is under a curse maybe yeah oh, okay. but, but anyway yeah the okay. yeah whoever's trying to keep the laws under a curse yeah oh i might have said that in chapter three somewhere yeah here it is verse 10 Whoever, as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, because it's written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. So that's why we're under a curse if we're trying to keep the law, because we have to keep all of them all perfectly, of them. and yeah. you and I can't do it. So it's a curse, and the curse is is death. The curse is Deuteronomy 28, I believe it is. Remember Deuteronomy 28, the, 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 the blessings and the cursings? Yes. All the blessings that you get if you keep the commandments and all the cursings if you don't keep the commandments. Well, we, we get all the cursings for not keeping the commandments because we can't do it. So, yes, yeah, so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him or credited to him or imputed to him as righteousness. So Christ's righteousness is credited to us and our sins were credited to him, weren't they? That's Second Corinthians 5. 21 he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we may become the righteousness of god in him 
So that was a really good deal for us. All our sin goes to Jesus's account. All his righteousness goes to our account. Not such a good deal for Jesus. He had to suffer the, the penalty for us. But so, so our sins were imputed to him and his righteousness was imputed to us. Okay. So, so yeah, what was the promise that God made to Abraham that he believed? Does anybody know off the top of your head? The whole the nations of the earth will be blessed. Yeah. All, yeah. The, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And through what? Through through your what? Seed, I think. Or your children. Your descendants or your seed. Through your seed. Your seed. Through your seed. Through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Oh. Now, the immediate fulfillment of that was through Isaac. Isaac was the child of promise, but ultimately who he's looking to as the seed is Christ. Christ is the seed of Abraham. And that's is that in Galatians? Let's see. Well, I can't remember off the top of my head where that is, but it's but Paul spells it out specifically. He says it says it was through your seed, and that seed specifically being Christ. Um, let's go to uh, let's go to Genesis chapter twelve once. I think that's a really neat, really neat picture because it's going to say, let's see, am I twelve three? Yeah, twelve Genesis twelve. Well, yeah, we'll go to Genesis twelve one through four. Okay. Genesis 12, 1 through 4. The Lord said to Abraham, or Abram, go forth from your country, okay, uh, to, from your relatives, from your father's house, to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. So you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of earth shall be blessed. So Abram went forth. As the Lord had spoken to him, Lot went with him. Abraham, just, Abraham was 75 years old at this time when he departed from Haran. Now, he didn't talk about the seed yet. If we go to chapter 15, chapter 15, 1 through 6, let's see, is this it? Okay, this is where he's going to repeat it to, to Abram. It says, don't fear, I'll be a shield for you. Your reward is going to be very great. And this is where Abraham starts to question God a little bit. He says, oh, Lord God, what, what are you going to give me? He said, I'm childless. I don't have any kids yet. And the heir of my house is Eli Eliezer of Damascus. He's a steward of my house. And so he figures, okay, is that where, how you're going to do it, Lord? He says, you've given me no offspring. And the one born in my house is my heir. So the Lord comes and says, the word of the Lord came to him saying, no, it says, it's not going to be this man. He's not going to be your heir, but the one who shall come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. Took him outside, said, look towards the heaven, count the stars if you can. So <laughs> shall your descendants be. Well, good luck counting all the stars. So he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So and the Lord had brought you out of the Ur of Chaldeans to give you this land. And someplace... He says it's through your seed. We'll get there eventually. 17. Let's see, is this it? Hmm. Why am I not finding that? I'm going to have to Google it. I thought I had that in my... Oh, wait. Maybe it's 18. Let's see. Hmm. maybe it's 22 <laughs> sorry about that i thought uh, i was prepared and i'm not here it is here it is 22 chapter 22 um he, he repeats the promise to him he gives it to him the first time in chapter 12 then he repeats it again in chapter 15 repeats it again in chapter 17 and again in 18 and chapter 22 he's starting to make it a little more clear okay genesis 22 verse 17 
said, indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed, there's where it's, because all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now it's still kind of veiled in here. It's not, you know, just like a lot of prophecy. It's not real evident that he's talking about Christ. Um, is it, maybe it's Romans. Yeah, let's, okay, let's, maybe it's Romans 4 where he said that. Romans 4. Romans 4, verse 13, I think it is. See if that's the one I'm looking for. Verse 13. Hmm, 13. Promise to Abraham and or to his descendants that he would be the heir of the world was not through the law before through the righteousness of faith. Hmm. All right. My memories let me down. Let's see if I can Google it real quick. It is. Oh, gee whiz. It's in Galatians chapter three. I, all I had to do. <laughs> <laughs> looking all over the place it's in this chapter <laughs> boy oh well <laughs> guess, guess the lord needed to humble me well, that uh, was funny yeah let's see all right oh here it is yeah verse 16 now the promises galatians three sixteen. now the promises were spoken to abraham and to his seed Notice he does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed that is Christ. So there, Paul makes it pretty clear, doesn't he? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. All right. So he's going to bless all nations through his seed. That's through Christ. So Christ came through the lineage of Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, etc comes heir of the world so next question question nine it's not real clear in in galatians but how did how did abraham demonstrate his faith how did we know his faith was genuine it's going to be in hebrews 11 is where it talks about that there's two things that are recorded in a in hebrews 11 the first one is whenever it's by hebrews 11 8 and 9 by faith abraham when he was called he obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance remember that's what we just read in genesis god told him to go out to this land that you don't know about so he obeyed even though he didn't know what he was getting into that was an act of faith wasn't it God just said go, and he said, "Okay, I believe you. I trust you. I, I, I'm putting my life in. Basically, I'm putting my life in your hands. I, I can trust you with that." So he obeyed. Said by faith when he was called, he obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. So that that takes some faith, doesn't it? Imagine packing up all your belongings. God says, "Okay, go to I don't know, pick a place. Go to Africa." <laughs> Gee. Yeah. Is that what you call blind faith? Mm. That's the same thing. I I guess I've heard someone say that before. Blind faith. Well, I mean, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of right. things not seen. So I guess true faith is blind, isn't it? Because it's yeah. trusting in something you can't see. Yeah. So I guess that would be. I I would agree with that, Lori. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. All right. So he went out not knowing where he was going trusted god and there's another one i don't know if i'm going to tell you that one yet i want to i'm going to hold off on that one okay that, we're going to hold off on that one until we go to question 12 all right so anyway he believed god even though he didn't 
know what was going to happen. It was blind faith, as Lori said. And so the next question, we're going to back up to verse 7. Who are Abraham's offspring? Galatians 3, verse 7. Seven. Somebody want to read Galatians 3, verse 7? Seven. I'll read it. <clears throat> know then that is know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. All right, those of faith. Who would that be? Anybody in on this call? <laughs> Should be all of us. Yeah, I, yeah, it should be all of us, right? <laughs> er, everyone who is of faith, everyone who's put their trust in, in Jesus is a child of Abraham, aren't we? Wasn't there a song we used to sing in Bible school? Father Something? Abraham. Yeah, Abraham. Father Abraham. Yeah. I can't remember the words. Do you remember the words, Lori? I don't. <laughs> but I remember the song. Yeah. Abraham. And then he sings. Yep. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not about to sing it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. Father Abraham had many sons. So yeah, we're we're children of Abraham, aren't we? Yeah. Of Abraham by faith in Christ. All right. The next verse eight. Uh, how did God proclaim the gospel to Abraham in advance? Says God claim the gospel to Abraham in advance. Remember, Abraham lived like 2,000 years before Jesus. It says there, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. That's you and me. We're probably all Gentiles. That's anybody that's not a Jew. God foresaw that God, or the scriptures foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. He preached the gospel beforehand or in advance to Abraham saying, all the nations shall be blessed in you. We saw that in in Genesis 15. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. So there was something specific God did that illustrated the gospel pretty vividly. Anybody remember off the top of your head? Let's go to Genesis 22. Genesis 15 and then 22. We'll read 15 again. I think this is a really, really cool event. Genesis 15. So, yeah, so Genesis 12 was where God initially gave the promise to Abraham. He was 75 years old at this time. And remember, Sarah was already barren at this time. They had no children. Sarah was unable to conceive that was chapter 12 chapter 15 was the deal with uh eliezer because a couple more years have, have passed by this time and abe and sarah are getting a little desperate okay how are you going to do this lord is it going to be eliezer nope it's not going to be eliezer chapter 16 another 10 years 10 years have passed chapter 16 He's about 85 by this time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Talking about patience that, that Joanna and Lori were talking about. He's 10 years has gone by. Okay, God, you promised me that I'm going to be a father of many nations. 10 years have gone by. We're not getting any younger. Sarah's still barren. What's going on here? Remember, and that's when they decided to take matters into their own hands. That I mean, that this here's a, this is a work of the flesh, isn't it? Remember mm -hmm. when Sarah said, okay, I've got an idea, Abe. I've got a handmaiden, Hagar. She'll bear you a child. That That's how God's going to do it, helping God out. And, of course, you know what happened. That, that was where Ishmael was born. And remember, there's there was conflict between, we'll see this when we get to chapter four. There's conflict between Ishmael and Isaac from day one. Well, not from day one, because Isaac wasn't born until like 13 years later but there's conflict from basically from the day that Isaac was born because Ishmael God said that Ishmael is going to be a wild donkey of a man that's in Genesis and do, do you know who the descendants of Ishmael are yeah. 
the, the Arabians, I believe. The, the, all, all the Arab nations, all the, Arab all the Muslim, right. yeah, the Arabs, the Muslims, uh, huh. they all trace their lineage back to, to Ishmael. And God said he's going to fight with his brothers, he said he's going to be a wild donkey of a man. We don't see any of that today, do we? Any fighting between the Arabs and the, and the Israelis? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's been happening for what, two, four, over 4,000 years now. Yeah. And and it was basically because of uh you know works of the flesh, wasn't it? Is because Abraham, I mean, and Abraham is the father of the of the faithful. I mean, he's like Father Abraham, that he's like the a pillar, and yet it's because of his act of the flesh that we have all this uh this turmoil in the Middle East. Um, so another reason why we shouldn't try to perfect ourselves by the flesh, isn't it? It's that bad, bad things happen. So anyway, so Ishmael is born. God said, that's not the way it's going to happen. Chapter 17, he's up, Abraham's up to 99 years old now. This is, what, 24 years after the promise is given. That's when the covenant of circumcision was given. We talked about this a little bit one of the first couple of weeks, but this would be a good time to talk about that again. Remember the, the circumcision that was right after, shortly after Ishmael was born and the, the, the covenant of circumcision, God gave that. He says, circumcise the flesh of the flesh of your foreskin. Key word there, the flesh. And he says, it's going to be the sign. Paul's going to tell us in Romans 4, that circumcision is a sign of righteousness that comes by faith rather than righteousness that comes by our flesh. So God gave him a, a physical sign to say, okay, Abe, can I make this any clearer? Your flesh is going to have nothing to do with this promise. Your flesh is not going to bring about this Messiah, this seed. And that that's and that's what the circumcision was. It was to so that we don't put any confidence in our flesh, that we that it's by faith and faith alone that, that seed, the Messiah, is going to come by promise, by God's work, trusting in him, not by any works of our flesh. So that's chapter 17 of Genesis. Now, chapter, let's go on to, let's see, chapter 18. He's repeating the promise again. 18, 18, Abraham, you'll surely become a great nation. We jump ahead. There's some things happening there that aren't really pertinent here. Um, chapter 21, Isaac is finally born. So after the covenant of circumcision, Abe finally got the point, and Sarah conceived. Isaac was born. Finally, Abraham finally got that son that he was looking for, his only son. God, God calls him his only son, even though he had Ishmael, but he doesn't. He considers Isaac his his only, essentially his only begotten son. Which does that sound familiar? Jesus is the only begotten son of the Father. Yes. So he considers Isaac your only son. So he's born in chapter 21. He's the basically the apple of Abe's eye. This is the son he's finally, he's been look, longing for. He, he loves Isaac dearly. Look what happens in chapter 22. Finally, and by this time there's a couple years, no more than just a couple years. Isaac is probably, we're only talking like one chapter, but we're talking probably might be, could be as many as 18 years gone by. Isaac is probably a teenager. Abraham's well over 100. And the reason I bring that up is because if Isaac wanted to, he could have stopped his dad from what he was about to do. So he, Isaac went through this willingly, just like, and, and I, well, I'm going to give the story away, so I'll, I'll stop there. But anyway, um, I'll, I'll fill it in in a minute. So here we go. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. Here's verse 2. God said to Abraham, now take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah, offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Can you imagine what Abraham must have been going through at this point? Here's the son that he's been longing for. He's 
probably a teenager by now. I I don't know about the rest of you, but I, man, I I don't know. That would have been a tough one. I don't know how you would do that. But look, it doesn't say anything about Abraham arguing or anything. It says Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. He split wood. Okay, he's got wood for the burnt offering. He arose and went to the place of which God had told him. So, well, I, I had, yeah, I had to give you more background. Anyway, this is this is a picture of God giving up His own Son, right? God the yeah. Father giving up His one and only Son, the one that He loved. God loved His Son dearly. He was willing to give Him up. And Abraham, this this is how God is preaching the gospel to Abraham in advance. He's giving him a, a vivid picture. I mean, how much more vivid can you get than what's going to happen here? So he splits wood for the burnt offering. Verse four is interesting. Genesis 22, verse four. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Now in Abraham's, okay, this is three days after after God told him to sacrifice Isaac. So as far as Abraham was concerned, Isaac was a dead man, right? God told him to, to sacrifice your son. So for these three days, imagine Abraham had to deal with this for three for three days before it actually took place. So for those three days, as far as Abraham was concerned, his son Isaac was dead, right? Of course, we know Jesus was three was dead three days and three nights in the in the earth. So on the third day, he raised his eyes, saw the place from a distance. He said to the young men, now look what he says here in verse five. Stay here with the donkey. I and the lad will go yonder and we will worship and return to you. Okay. That, that sounds like faith to me, doesn't it? He says, we're going to worship and we're going to return to you. So he's, he's telling these men that this lad is coming back. We're, we're going to see... Hold your finger there and jump to jump back to Hebrews eleven. This is how this is why Abraham was able to do this. Go back to Hebrews eleven. Hebrews eleven, verses seventeen through nineteen. Uh, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. Is he whom it was said, in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. Okay, so God made this promise to Abraham that, that through in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. Okay, so God made a promise to him. Through Isaac, you're going to have descendants. So Abraham, he believed God. He trusted God. God says, through, your, through Isaac, your descendants are going to come. So he knew God was faithful. So how? So he's probably reasoning in his mind, you know, how are you going to pull this off, God? He says, through Isaac, I trust you. So look what he says here. Um, verse 19, he considered that God is able to raise men, even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. So he knew God could raise the dead. So his reasoning was, okay, I'm going to sacrifice Isaac. God, I can hardly even say this without breaking up. <clears throat> he said, I'm going to sacrifice Isaac, but I know God, I can trust God. He's going to raise him from the dead. And he proved that in, in verse 5 of, of uh, Genesis 22, when he said, I and the lad are going to worship and we're going to come back. So he he believed God. He trusted God. God promised him that through Isaac, through your seed, your descendants are going to come. I don't know how you're going to do it, Lord. I'm trusting you. You're going to bring Isaac back from the dead. I know you can do it. Genesis 22. Where are we? Genesis 22. Okay. Back to verse five. We will worship and and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the, now look at this verse six. He took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. So Isaac is carrying the own, the own, the wood, the very wood that he's going to be sacrificed on. Does that ring a bell? Anybody else carry the, the wood that he was going to be sacrificed on? Yes. Jesus, the cross. 
carrying the cross. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Isaac's carrying the wood that's going to cause him his death. He took it in his hand and the fire, took the fire for the burnt offering, took the knife. The two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. <clears throat> and he said, here I am, my son. He said to Abraham, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. So here he he's, he's not sure how God's going to do it. He's either going to raise him from the dead or he's going to provide a lamb. I don't know how you're going to do it, Lord, but I'm trusting you. So he told Isaac, he said, God's going to provide himself the lamb. Actually, some say that the word for is not in the original. That it's, it's, it says God will provide himself the lamb. In other words, God is going to be the lamb. Jesus is the lamb. So the word will is not in the original language there. So God will provide, I'm sorry, the for is not in there. God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. They came to the place where which God had told him. Abraham built the altar there, arranged the wood, bound his son Isaac. So he's binding his son Isaac on the on this altar. Isaac is probably a teenager at this time. Abraham is over a hundred. He's probably like a hundred and fifteen, maybe. So if Isaac didn't want to do this, you think he could overpower his hundred and fifteen year old father? Probably, right? So it's just another picture of Jesus, how he submitted to the will of the Father. So Isaac is submitting to the will of his father. I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you, Father. I'm trusting that God is going to provide the lamb. So they came to the place, built the altar, bound Isaac, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand. He took the knife to slay his son. How hard must, must that have been? But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad. Do nothing to harm do nothing to him for now i know that you fear god since you have not withheld your son your only son from me abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns and abraham went and took the ram offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son called name that place the lord will provide so anyway i don't know i sorry i got a little bit <laughs> it's okay so anyway, that's how God uh, pro proclaimed the gospel in advance to Abraham. That, that was a pretty vivid picture, wasn't it? Yeah, yes, absolutely. So, yeah. all right, that's probably a good place to stop for the night, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you, for, thank you for going through that. Um, sure. You know, I never really drew that picture together so so tightly, and it made me messed up too so yeah thanks for showing that to us sure yeah my pleasure all right so what's our what's our lesson for tonight other than god's amazing love for us we have to be like abraham unconditionally have faith in god and, okay. and he does things and we can't imagine how he's going to do things, but he's going to do things. And he really wants us to sacrifice ourselves as Abraham sacrificed his son and had, as God sacrificed and Jesus sacrificed himself for us. So that's what we have to do. Okay. Yeah, tr trust God even when we don't understand what's going on, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's always easier, easy after the fact, and we see what, how God worked in it. But when we're in the middle of it, it's tough sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm. All right. Anybody have any other insights to share? Yes. Um, from time to time, I know we had talked about this. Um walking in the faith and also just examine ourselves sometimes just to check to make sure we're not going in the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to go backwards. We don't want to be under a curse either. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. 
Yeah, check check our motors. Yes, check our motors. Check our motors. Yep. Yeah. That's always a good idea. Yeah, thank you, Lori. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Would someone like to pray for us? Volunteer. I volunteer, Dan. <laughs> <You're a> volunteer. <laughs> I was waiting for Connie to appoint somebody. <laughs> Wait, so that worked out well last time. No, I'm just kidding. Dan, but okay, let me set up. <laughs> so Connie's going to appoint Dan to pray. Uh, yeah. Would you mind praying for us, Dan? Sure, no, that's fine. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, um, thank you for uh, for this uh, wonderful picture you've given us of uh, salvation and um, sacrifice and um, and your uh, nature of, of uh, providing a, a way for us to, to be saved. And um, I just pray that that will motivate us to, uh, to love you and live for you every day and uh, that we'll do our best and um, Help us keep us in balance so that we're living uh, living in the spirit and not doing it in our own flesh. And let's pray you'll uh, help us uh, bring us again together again in, in a few weeks or whenever that is. And thank you for your blessings. And I just pray that you'll uh, help us to um, serve you until we meet again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dan. All right. Thanks, everybody. Y'all have a blessed Bye, everybody. week. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.